Right, I am Gareth Williams. Uh, this is a heap of um, technologies that I commonly work with, and you can find me on places like that. Um, so, uh, commonly, I've, I've worked at a number of different uh, companies, and there seems to be sort of three distinct tiers. There's agencies, startups, and enterprise, and there's common sort of pitfalls of each, uh, in my opinion, anyhow. So uh, agencies and startups are commonly seen as very creative places. They're very fast paced, um, but enterprise is often seen as the opposite of that. So it's much slower paced, much less creative. Uh, th with agencies, I'd say that it's all client led. Um, and when it comes to startups, it's the best of intentions. So they're trying to, to build things with the future in mind. And the same is true of enterprise. So you have short lifespans at digital agencies because of it being short-lived um, turnaround with uh, client-driven uh, items and perhaps slightly constrained budgets. And you don't have that same problem at startups and enterprise. And the other thing that I'd say is uh, you've probably got a bit more structure at an enterprise versus um, somewhere like an agency. There's a little bit more instability. So uh, Kingfisher is a home improve, improvement retailer. It very much falls into the enterprise level um, end. And I'm hopefully going to uh, illuminate you as to how we go about things. Um, we're one of the largest uh, e-commerce uh, platforms in Europe. We've got about 950 UK stores, of which 300 of those roughly are uh, B&Q. We've got 77,000 employees, the majority of which are in-store retail colleagues. Um, and then we have around about 100 engineers, that's not including our systems uh, architects and, and the like. Um, and we have around 30 uh, React devs. So our tech stack, it's PHP, Scriptaculous, cPanel, Fedora, and FTP, right? Anyone remember that? That was quite a while ago. That's, that's not what we do. Uh, it looks a lot more like this. So um, we're um, kind of on trend for what is uh, common in the marketplace at the moment, I would say, um, with a few exceptions. Uh, so we have a sort of functional approach, uh, RESTful services. We haven't actually looked at um, GraphQL, but that is an aspiration that we certainly have. Uh, the core, we've got um, TypeScript, React, Redux, Redux Saga. We use reselect for um, some of the state layer interaction. And then uh, we're using Post CSS so we can get some um, up-to-date CSS features and some uh, useful bits and bobs. Uh, unit testing, we've got Mocha Chai and we're using Redux Saga test plan for testing our sagas. Functional tests, we've got WDIO, uh, Cucumber, we use Wiremock for mocking all of our RESTful services. And ancillary items, we've got a number of linters, uh, so that would be ESLint and uh, a whole heap of plugins, style lint, learner for managing the mono repo. And then obviously Docker, and we've got GitLab pipelines for our CI stuff and hosting our code and all, all sorts of other bits and bobs. So some stats, uh, we have 267 folders, as I found out today, of React components, of which inside there, there will be multiple React components inside numerous files. There'll be multiple React components again, despite the fact that we're trying to uh, police that and uh, bring them into individual files. I've got about 9,000 files, 274 node modules, three gigabyte repo size. Uh, time to first uh, meaningful paint is uh, 10,075 milliseconds, and we've got an initial payload size of 3.7 megabytes, which is not fantastic, but could be worse, I suppose. So a uh, quick look, um, DIY.com, as I'm sure you may already have visited once upon a time. Uh, typical sort of e-commerce journey. You have a list of products. You have a number of category pages that are fed from um, a CMS. Um, and uh, yeah, you have your typical sort of uh, basket journey as well. And then in addition to that, we also have um, some items that are designed to sort of help you along your purchasing journey. So for example, sheds. If you're really into sheds, this is something that you might like. Um, but yeah, it's designed to sort of help you pick the right shed for you or calculate how many fence posts you might need, that sort of thing. Um, so uh, in addition to that, we've got the, the home improvement platform. 
um, the HIP team, and we do things like the, uh, the visualizer, and this is designed to give you an idea of um, what your kitchens could look like prior to actually coming in store and having a 3D consultant uh, sit there and design something for you so you can change the look and feel of your, um, your kitchen, get an idea of the sort of products that you'd want to go into store and have a look at before you actually um, commit to doing that. So, why do we? TypeScript. Uh, we found that really useful for documenting code and then um, there's uh, greater predictability. It's been vastly useful when it comes to documentation. Um, IntelliSense built into most of your IDEs. And when paired with a declarative coding style, then it's really easy to reason about what things are trying to do, even if they're sometimes unsuccessful. Um, and then when it comes to React, that's been really uh, useful for uh, breaking things into smaller chunks and uh, giving things a sort of uh, split, splitting into containers and components so that we have presentational items and then things that will house, house a little bit more logic. And you can think about things a little bit better in isolation. Uh, Redux, obviously, that's really useful for managing our state layer and enforcing a unidirectional data flow. And then we've elected to use um, Redux Saga because there is a hell of a lot of business logic going on and it makes it so much more manageable and it's testable. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it's easy to sort of yield to other functions and uh, get some data back before you continue. So we also use Reselect. That's been really useful for uh, performance um, and also just managing the selection of uh, slices of data in a really testable way. Um, we also use Learner. That's for managing a monorepo. We have a lot of different packages that make up this entire entity and it would be really difficult to maintain particular version numbers um, without the use of Learner and having everything um, yeah, it's satellite in all sorts of places. It, it promotes us using a sort of don't repeat yourself a dry, dry principle. We have a UI library, so a sort of, I'm not gonna call it a design system. It is not a design system. Um, but uh, it's a set of commonly uh, reusable components um, and they promote UX standards and um, it's all sort of hung together in, um, in Storybook which I'm sure people have probably used quite a lot, but it's fallen into disrepair. So um, this has sort of been superseded by uh, fresh new attempts. And that's commonly a problem that I'll see in enterprise because you have a hell of a lot of people in multiple sites working on something at the same time. You'll have five design systems or attempts at design systems at the same time. Previously where I worked at Lloyd's, exactly the same problem. There was five simultaneous attempts uh, design system, which was not necessarily useful, especially when you're trying to police consistency as a design team. Um, so uh, yes, we're using um, Mocha, Chai, WDIO, and then we've got ESLint and um, Starlint, and that's obviously set up via um, hooks to um, police code quality and uh, promote confidence as we go through our pipeline. So we've got uh, regression of visual regressions via screenshots. We mark all of our data, so we're just testing the front end in isolation. Uh, and then that's uh, a lot of that stuff that happens as part of the hooks on uh, commit and push is repeated again in CI. So things that I think that we do well. Uh, I think it's easy to reason about what goes on in the code base. There isn't a great many what the fucks per minute going on in the, uh, in the team. Uh, certainly we're trying to reduce those that already do exist. Um, we have a lot of people contributing and it's actually set up in a fashion whereby that is actually possible um, without people tripping over each other and I think a lot of that comes down to the organisational structure as well as the code structure. Um, so the, the fact that there is a dedicated purpose for different folders or sections of the code base, the fact that it's broken up into multiple different packages and managed as a mono repo like you'd see um, something like Babel. Um, and they each have a defined purpose. You don't have any sprawling functions that are 500 lines long with a sort of really abstract, fluffy purpose. 
uh, like perhaps again at Lloyd's where there was, I think the login system for Lloyd's banking was a million lines and it was handed over to IBM to say, fix this, and IBM went, no, thank you. Um, yeah, not fantastic. Um, but the additions of stuff like IntelliSense and having TypeScript in there really assists us in being able to work out the call signatures for, or for um, functions and stuff like that. And then, obviously, it's all about naming, naming conventions. So hopefully, yep you should be able to get to grips with what's going on here, fingers crossed. So this is the room visualizer, that's named uh, Range Explorer. But effectively we've broken things down into uh, context, so that's where you're gonna have the, uh, a folder full of um, React context API um, files. You've then got your hooks, reusable hooks, um, you've got your localization stuff in a defined place, and then this is all sat within core. So you have a split of core and web. Web's where you've got all your um, components, presentational. And then down here in views, we actually have our more, our containers effectively. So this is the only items that are hooked up to state, as you'd see down here. Um, and then if you go back up to here, you'll see all of the actions all nicely defined. You can kind of work out what they're doing yep. at a glance. Um, so it means that for onboarding, which I think is, it's really intimidating coming into a big enterprise where there's a hell of a lot of people. So uh, trying to make things as intelligible as possible, easy to, to maintain and actually contribute on your first day. Uh, I think that goes a long way to promoting a positive working environment. So uh, then we've got our sagas somewhere down here. So they're all sort of hooked up together at the bottom. So they're going to take a particular action. And then that's going to delegate um, an ac this action to a particular generator function denoted by the asterisk. And then as you'll see here, that's try catch. So if something fails during the processing of this, it's going to submit um, an action for uh, initialization failure, and then we can handle that on the front end appropriately. But effectively, all it's doing is it's looking at the query string, uh, determining what the size is, disappearing off and getting all the data from the API, and then um, updating the URL and, and starting, the, uh, starting the front end. It's not just about structure, as I alluded to, of a code base. It's also about structuring your day and how you approach problems. So what we've got uh, um, in, at uh, Kingfisher is uh, safe, the Scaled Agile Framework. So Scaled Agile for Enterprises, I think, is the actual acronym. So that means that we are split into uh, release trains, and they will each own an artifact. So you've got next gen, hip, um, et cetera. Um, and they'll have a particular um, part of the code base or a they're not supposed to be inter interwoven, so you can be, uh, act independently of each other. We also have ceremonies, so I'm sure a number of you do this. So you'll split your week up, uh, or your working um, period up into two weeks sprints, and as part of that, you'll have um, ceremonies. So you'd have a backlog refinement, you'll have your sprint planning, uh, you might have your retro and a demo to stakeholders. But we also split up our uh, working quarter, so we do a, th a three month cycle. So that will be made up of five or six individual sprints, one of which will be an IP sprint at the end, which is where we do something called PI planning, where we plan our next increment. It's the planning increment. So uh, the next um, increment would be um, the, the next three month period, and we would organize each of our sprints very roughly. We also have guild sessions. So the guild sessions are about people from a particular craft coming together. So if you're a developer, you'll go to the developers guild or whatever else. And it's an opportunity for you uh, to suggest new patterns, uh, present new technology, resolve any of your frustrations that you might be feeling about the code base and how we're still stuck on React Router 3. Um, or suggest some new patterns or just, just listen to the directives that are being sent from the big wigs up above. Uh, so, also as part of the IP sprint, we do innovation, so it's innovation and planning. 
So it's actually structured. Um, so we're doing innovation and personal development at the same time during that two week period, as well as planning our next three months. Uh, the fact that it's structured and there is dedicated time means that you actually get, get the opportunity to develop your career, whereas at the smaller companies, I've never really had an opportunity to do that. And I very rarely have received um, any feedback from managers in a structured way, maybe a bit sweary at times, but that was about it. Um, and we have a lot of licenses for Udemy and stuff like that, and we are encouraged to go away and spend some time actually uh, learning and developing. And there's um, a number of colleagues will make themselves available to present architectural diagrams to you or point you in the direction of uh, useful courses that you might find useful to avoid some of the frustrations later down the line. It's a really helpful and friendly team and I think that's the most important thing. So with any luck, I should be able to demo what we did for our last innovation sprint. So this is the room visualizer again and this was done in a day. Uh, Flavio did it in a day, right? Anyway. Um, the idea was that we would have a series of, uh, we've, we've got a new catalogue going into each of the stores, so a whole heap of products are being ripped out and new ones are being put in. So there's a two month increment where there will not be any kitchens inside our uh, stores, but we do have this room visualiser and that is what we're depending on and a load of product samples. So if you took a number of RFID tags that you could uh, stick to each of these various products, then with any luck, yeah, it's still working. Uh, with any luck, you should be able to change what you see in the visualizer as you pick up a product sample and place it on an RFID reader. So this is just an Arduino that um, is using the serial monitor. There is then a server running, uh, which has WebSockets configured, and then the front end is actually listening out for that. So um, each time I put a new RFID tag, this will change the floor, by the way. You'll see the floor change at the bottom. So if that were attached to a, a floor tile, for example, that could be quite useful. And then this is for a cabinet. So as I place that on the RFID reader, there you go. That is a beautiful kitchen. <laughs> Would anybody be keen? No. Uh, so because that got done in half a day, we got to this point in half a day, uh, we had a stretch objective which was to actually make it easier for colleagues in store to, it, um, to set up each of these RFID tags. So if you see the red line at the top, that means you're in admin mode. So if I were to pick up one of these RFID tags, place it on and then interact with a particular product, that would then be saved to a MongoDB. This is this product EAN. So that's a sort of idea of what we do in an IP, or sorry, an innovation sprint. So that's what we do well. And then uh, things we're working on, I think code hygiene, I think Rachel said this earlier, it's like your personal hygiene, you've got to do it every day. Um, it's one of them things that never actually finishes. Um, so you've got to keep on top of it. Uh, we're trying to be better when it comes to guilds. A lot of this stuff will be brought up. But um, yeah, we're trying to find new ways of communicating that and making it easy to highlight these things, whether that's designing our own linters or things like that. Um, upgrading dependencies, as I said earlier, React Router 3, fantastic. Um, it's inhibiting uh, progress now because there's a number of other tools that we'd like to be using that we're unable to, or a, a number of other features like the latest version of Redux or uh, Redux, uh, React Redux and hooks and all that kind of stuff. It's not, not possible because we're locked into that particular version. Continuous delivery, I think everybody's trying to get there, right? If they're not already, and uh, we certainly are not. We've got the CI pipeline, but things are progressing slowly. And that's what I think is important to be aware of if ever you think of joining an enterprise. It's glacial. They, it's, it's like turning a juggernaut. It takes a long time for anything to turn around, but things will be moving. And that takes me to the next point, communication and transparency. Reports and updates from the seniors would be really, are really useful for us, understanding that our concerns are being listened to. Um, and then also presenting that back in guild sessions to, so you can actually collect some of that feedback or having the, the safe approach 
where you have an inspect and adapt session at the end of every uh, three, three month in increment where you can actually go to the stakeholders or they're present when you're whinging about the company. Um, and then uh, documentation is obviously hugely important. I like the idea of having it in artifacts. So if you have the code base uh, and you're updating your documentation day to day, um, the advantage of having it in Git is that you can see some of the robust discussion that goes on about the uh, design decisions that are involved there. And also, if you wanted to go back in time and have a look at something, it'll again be up to date. You'll be seeing the documentation for the particular version that you're looking at. If we do what we do at the moment, which is house all of that stuff in Confluence or similar, it gets outdated. Or you look up documentation when you first start that is six months out of date, and it's hugely frustrating. Then we're looking at stuff like type, um, type docs uh, or TS doc so that we can document the code that currently exists and stop people sort of uh, reinventing the wheel, shall we say. Performance is not fantastic, so we're looking at code splitting. And then actually, it's React Conf today, right, over in Nevada. So I think tomorrow there'll be a heap load of videos and, well, over the weekend there'll be plenty of watching. I heard rumor of React Suspense, React Cache, and React Lazy being kind of finished which would be fantastic, because that would massively improve um, our front-end performance. And then design system, it'd be great to actually have one. Just one. Uh, designed and uh, owned by the design system, uh, the, by the designers. I'm going to be quite opinionated here. Uh, but if you were to sit a bunch of creative technologists with the designers and have a sort of customer experience ca capability within an organization, then you have a research team, UX, UI, and creative technologists sitting together. You have a closed circle, so research can come up with a proposition. UX and UI can perfect that. Creative technologists build it, and then it goes straight back into research as a built artifact. So you can be making assumptions or testing actual living, breathing code. And then the artifact that is delivered to the front end developers who are more concerned now with your business logic can be confident that the, the design system is too, it's standardized and to the, the designer's liking, and it's accessible and all that kind of stuff because it's gone through the, the relevant research protocols. Um, so the advantage of that as well is that it develops a sort of unified design language. If I'm turning around to a designer and saying, I'm thinking of the accordion, they know exactly what I'm thinking, rather than you know they call it an accordion and I call it a banana. Um, and then decoupling the theme, so if necessary, we could actually have someone develop a Vue.js application, but still use the same theme. It needs to be opinionated. If it isn't opinionated, then you haven't really got a design system. You've got something that can be extended and mutated, and then standardization just immediately goes out of the window. Cool. That's a little overview of how we do uh, engineering at a big enterprise like Kingfisher.